start this talk without introducing quantum computing, right? So the first thing is quantum mechanics is now almost 100 years old, right? I would date it back probably to 1925 uh, with Heisenberg. But in 1927, the theory was almost laid out. And this is the famous Solvay conferences. You can, conference, you can recognize a lot of faces there. There is Einstein, Schrodinger, Planck, uh, Lawrence, a lot of cool people in this, in this conference. But it was only in the 80s that people started thinking that they could use quantum mechanical systems to perform computation. And the idea was, when we have these quantum many body systems, so we have a lot of quantum particles and we want to let them evolve, we have to use matrices and vectors that are exponential in the number of particles. So if you have a system of with n particles, you need vectors of 2 to the n magnitude. And this is problematic. We cannot really simulate these things very often. But the idea is that nature is able to make them work fast. So why don't we use natural systems to simulate other quantum mechanical objects? That was the first idea, more or less by Benioff, Feynman, and Manning, more or less at the same time. Okay. So the field is relatively recent, and it developed a bit more around the 1995, where two of the most famous algorithms popped out. Uh, one is the algorithm by Love Grover, and it's an algorithm for speeding up unstructured search. So if, like you have a database, you want to search for an entry. Normally, in the worst case, if you have no structure, no ordering, you would have to take order of the number of points in the data set. Grover found a method. We, we can discuss this a bit better later, but found a method to search in this database with a quadratic advantage. So you can do it in square root of n. It's very counterintuitive. Like n is a lower bound in classical complexity. So that's impressive. But even more impressive probably is the result by Shore, where he showed how to, co to perform factoring. And basically, the same time you, it takes you to perform a multiplication and solving discrete log as well. So this breaks a lot of cryptographic primitives. And this was the reason for a lot of funding in the field. Okay, So basically, you break RSA, elliptic curve, uh, Diffie-Hellman, a lot of classical security that is actually employed uh, in our phones and laptops. Cool. So now I'm going to tell you a bit about the simplified rules of quantum mechanics before diving into quantum machine learning, because we have to set some terminology. We, we need to know what a qubit is. We need to know what a superposition is. I want to develop some intuition about entanglement and, and, and maybe bust some myths. So this is the part where you're encouraged to ask questions if, you don't, if, if you're not following. OK. so. A little spoiler, the things, the, the key takeaways here are that qubits or system of qubits, they span an exponentially large uh, Hilbert space. So basically qubits are exponentially large complex vectors. That's the way you represent them. We're going to see how and why, more or less. And they evolve via unitary operations. These unitary operations are basically operations that preserve norms. So you have these vectors that rotate in a space. And you're not stretching these vectors. Unitaries have are matrices with singular values equal to 1, are the complex equivalent of orthogonal matrices. And finally, we're, we'll talk about measurements, because you have to measure these quantum systems. But the problem is that these measurements are not fully informative. They don't give you a full description of the quantum states. And they actually corrupt the state. So you have to do, while well, in classical computers, you can look at the memory. In quantum computers, you cannot. You only measure at the end. Cool, OK. So to introduce the qubit, we have to think a bit about the bit. right? The bit is the classical unit of information. If you had to start a theory of computation, that's where you would start from, probably. You need some, some binary system, some difference. right? It can be black or white, uh, green or red. We chose 0 and 1, more or less as a convention, because we have math that helps with calculations. And you probably heard that a qubit is both 0 and 1 at the same time. So it can be in a superposition of 0 and 1 at the same time. But this concept is very hand wavy. Like, what does it mean to be both at the same time? We will, I, we hopefully, we will hopefully understand this better. 
So the idea is that a qubit is a vector in a complex space of dimension two. And just as in classical computing, we choose that zero and one are, uh, are the basic of our binary system, we choose an orthogonal basis for this vector space, which is this, uh, this canonical basis, one, zero, and zero, one, they span the space. And this is called the computational basis. Okay, this is, it's like the standard basis that you use for computation. And we call those vector state zero and state one. This bracket notation in here, it's also called Dirac notation. We will use it to compress vectors in a dense representation. Okay, this is usually the, the kind of matter you will see. And so if you have to express the state of a generic qubit, it's a linear combination with complex coefficients of these orthogonal vectors, okay? When you measure, we will understand this better later, but when you measure, you only see either zero or one. So you choose an orthogonal basis and you measure in that basis. So when you measure the qubit, you, you don't see the coefficients. You only see zero or one. So until you measure, the qubit can be in a superposition of these states. We will talk about measurements a bit later. But so, because the vector is somehow related to probabilities, this has to be a vector with unit norm, unit L2 norm. This is, this, those are the only rules. It's a complex combination of things. When you go to higher dimensions, you are basically spanning a space of two to the n size, okay? We, and, and basically the basis states, they, they are tensor products of qubits that represent the computational basis. So somehow you see that the, that the state zero, zero is, I mean, somehow you have a one hot encoding of these computational basis states, right? And in here, they, they, since you have this one hot encoding, right, they, they have vectors with eight entries. To abbreviate this notation, usually we write just the binary representation of the, of the, of the, of the basis state. So I could call this, state, the state one, and I could call this state the state two. You just have to know that they are in two bits or three qubits or more than tot qubits. And whenever you express a higher computational, I mean a higher uh, quantum state, a quantum state that is made of more qubits, then this is a linear combination of these bases in a higher dimensional space. So you can encode up to two to the n things in the amplitudes, in the coefficients of these representation. Okay, so that was the first point. Now, they also have to be unit vectors, by the way. We'll understand why in the measurements. Second part, you have unitaries. Unitary matrices are rotating these vectors. So you use them to perform computation. An algorithm, it's basically a unitary matrix. If you go deep into physics, which we don't want to do, you solve the Schrodinger equation, and you see that if you have finite systems with a finite number of qubits and the system is closed, then they evolve through these unitary processes. Okay, you, you, were, you will see that. But for what we are concerned, those are vectors that rotate in the space. Okay. And we will write our algorithms as unitary matrices. It's a very weird way of programming. It's not just like writing assembly for a different architecture. You're programming using math, rotations, linear algebra, and statistics. Okay, and of course, you can use qubits on larger states, and they have nice properties, like you can take products of unitaries and they stay unitary. Uh, this is somehow intuitive, right? Because you, can, you use them to describe time evolution, so you, you can discretize the time evolution in many unitaries, you just take products of them, and they, they, they still describe an evolution. Or you can use tensor products if you want a unitary to act on a certain qubit and not on the whole system. Okay. Hold just a few more moments. Now there are measurements. If you have questions again, ask them. Measurements, they work a bit like that. So you, you can imagine a state, the state of a quantum system more or less as a slot machine. So the beginning, your quantum system is in the old zero state. So you have all the qubits in the zero state. Then you apply some unitary process and you make this qubit in a superposition of other states. 
And the superposition lasts until you measure. Whenever you measure, the only thing that you're going to see is a state of the computational basis. So a configuration of zeros and ones, like the, the register becomes concrete. Right? You actually see that. And the thing is that you measure a certain value of the computational basis with a probability. And the probability is the square of the amplitude. I don't know if this is clear, but I'm going to ask you maybe a question so that we are sure that we are on the same page. So this is a quantum state. Uh, it is a superposition of the states 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1. The norm of this state sums up to 1 because 1 half plus 1 fourth plus 1 fourth is equal to 1. You're taking the squares of this value, summing them, right? Because you're doing the norm. So the first question is, what's the probability of measuring the state 0, 0? A half, right? Because it's the square of the amplitude that is associated with the computational basis state 0, 0. Correct. Cool. So now, another question. What's the probability of measuring the second qubit of this register in the state 1? I didn't tell you everything about measurements, but you, you, you could probably guess it. just by using classic, classical probability. Still one half, correct. Because basically you have two events that give you one. Either you measure 0, 1, and you do that with probability 1 fourth, or you measure 1, 1 with probability 1 fourth, so you sum the, the probability of the events. Okay, so the probability is still one half. Okay, cool. So now, what is the probability of measuring the first qubit in the state 0, given that the second, you, you measure the second, and it was 0? So you only measure the second qubit, and you found it 0, but you still didn't measure the first one. Yes, it's 1. Correct. Right? Because you couldn't have anything else. And lastly, this is a bit tougher maybe, but what is the probability of measuring the first qubit in state 0, given that the second is in 1. So you measure the second, it's in 1. Did someone say something? One half. Yes, because somehow the state collapses. So you measure the second qubit, and you get a 1. So you exclude the first computation path. Like, this path is not possible anymore. And now you're left with this state, but Actually, you need to renormalize the state. So you divide it by the norm of the state to make the amplitudes, again, to make the, nor the, the norm of the vector equal to 1. That's the general idea. OK, so what you saw in these last two examples, so the fact that if you measure 0, you get a 0 for sure, that is what we call entanglement. So entanglement is just basically some correlation, some weird correlation between the qubits. Okay, And the states that are entangled, are really entangled in the sense that you cannot express them as a tensor product of two independent qubits. So if you take this vector, you cannot express it as a tensor product of two uh, complex vector with norm one. This thing is entanglement. And this is one of the power of computation or in quantum computing. Whoops. OK. Cool. So we said the basic, the basic stuff. Now, I want to. Uh, but one myth. You usually hear that quantum computing is powerful because you can explore all the paths at once. You have this exponentially large space, and you can search in parallel all, through all the solutions and find the correct one. Is this true? This is something that you re hear a lot. Now that you know a bit about measurements and things, we can answer this question a bit better and bust this myth. OK, so let's put it like that. This is a simple uh, algorithm question. You have a function, and this is a problem that is called like searching for a needle in a haystack. You have a function that has a domain over binary strings, and it either outputs 0 or 1. And there is only one input that gives you 1 in output. Your task is to search for the correct input. 
So if you have to do it with a classical computer, you have to try all the configurations of the input, in the worst case, which are 2 to the n. Okay, you have to try all the bits configuration. What can you do with a quantum computer? I, I lead you to this step. So you start from the old zero state, you put it in a uniform superposition of all the computational basis states. So somehow you create this superposition that has all the possible bit strings of n bits with the same probability of appearing. And that's the second step. And then somehow you embed this function in a unitary process that considers both the registers. This is not something you have to imagine. We'll talk about how to embed this unitary in a few seconds. And then we'll move to machine learning, I swear. So the idea is that you apply this unitary, and somehow you entangle the result of the function to your input. So you have a state that looks like that. You have that the second qubit is 1 whenever the input is the input that you want. And that the second qubit is 0 for all the other possible states. So this is cool because this is very cheap. I mean, just, with just one call to our oracle, which is this function here, we embedded the solution in our quantum system. But now, what's the cost of retrieving this solution? If you try to measure the second qubit, it is very unlikely. So if you measure it and you measure one, then you measure the first qubit and you know the result. It's amazing. But the problem is that it is very unlikely to measure these uh, part of the system here because it only happens with probability that is 1 over 2 to the n, right? And, you know, it's like when you launch a dice. If you're launching a dice and you want the number 3 to happen, in expectation value, you need to launch it 6 times because the probability is 1 over 6, right? So you have to think about probabilities and expectation values of things happening. So this still maps back to the classical complexity, which is bad. So you have the information there, but you cannot extract it. The cool thing about this Grover algorithm is that you can have a quadratic speed up here. So basically, there are unitaries that you can create that boost the probability of measuring this state here by only making square root of 2 to the n calls to the oracle. But you cannot do better. Like you cannot solve it exponentially faster with a quantum computer, even though somehow you are trying all the paths at once. The problem is in, a bit in the measurements. And moreover, you cannot even clone this state. There are no cloning results. So you cannot take a value and clone it in another place and measure. No, you have to repeat the experiment from scratch. Because every time you measure, you destroy the state. And you cannot clone it because of unitarity of operations that implies reversibility and a lot of these things. OK, almost there. So, so far, we talk about the mathematics of this. So we have complex vectors. They evolve with unitaries. And you can perform measurements, which are disruptive. But we are computer scientists or computer engineers. So we might want to know how to work with this math and what's the complexity of implementing a unitary matrix. How do you implement it? So the, fortunately, there is a quantum gate model, right? And the gate model works by having some gates, like a knot, an end, this kind of gates, but in a quantum version, that implement small unitaries. And there are universal gate sets. So you have a set of these gates that combined allows you to span all the possible unitaries. Moreover, there are efficient ways to go from one gate set, universal gate set, to another universal gate set. So if you're a quantum algorithm programmer, you just think of a circuit. You write it down with your gates. It's like programming an FPGA, uh, like writing in Verilog, if you, if you know that, right? It's, you're programming hardware. You're describing how the circuits look like. You're not, you don't have an, impera, uh, like a, an iterative right, programming language. You have a descriptive programming language. So you describe how the circuits look like. And then the compilation that really depends on the hardware. But we can be agnostic of whether they're using photons, atoms, electrons. We don't care. We just write gates. Okay? And the complexity of switching from one gate model to another, it's, it's small. How do you measure complexity? Well, you have a few ways. 
uh, one way is you measure the number of gates that your circuit has or the number of gates that your algorithm needs to run because you will probably need multiple measurements and we do the experiment from scratch. So you just count the number of gates. That's a figure of merit in, uh, in complexity. You can also consider the depth, which is somehow how much can you parallelize your circuit. This is also another interesting information about the complexity of quantum circuits. And finally, you have this abstract complexity measure, measure which is the query complexity. So you're asking, how many times do I call a certain function? And then you're allowed to perform intermediate operation in between. So there are several complexity measures. Overall, do we expect quantum computers to replace classical computers? That's also a legit question. And the answer is no. With a quantum computer, you can do everything that a classical computer can do, but it is not necessarily faster. So the single operations are slower. It's just that you can perform some tasks with asymptotically less operations. But moreover, you have a lot of problems with quantum computers because qubits cannot hold their superposition state for long. They decohere and they go back to the zero state. They have a lot of problems. They have a lot of errors. So you need classical computers to detect the errors and correct them. This is why the single step is probably slower. But whenever you have an exponential speed up, like in factoring, it doesn't really matter if you have a constant overhead. You know? You're, you're somehow winning over this constant overhead of error correction with an exponential speed up that asymptotically kicks in with very big numbers, right? So again, it's like programming FPGAs. Cool. Are there any questions about this? There's one over there. You're right. Uh, yeah, that's a very good point. So you're saying that uh, you can get an, an, a, a speed up, a quadratic speed up over optimization problems. Uh, yes, but you get a quadratic speed up over a brute force, right? Because you're, in here, you're loading all the parameters somehow, and then you're trying to search for the best one. Uh, and the problem is that you get a quadratic speed up, but over the brute force. If you have some classical heuristic that work better than brute force, or classical methods work better than brute force, gaining a quadratic speed up is not that obvious. But I would also say that for most of the algorithms, we manage to find quadratic speed ups. Which is fine to, but, but you have to play weird tricks. It's a bit more tough. It's not that easy to find those speed ups. Like you always have speed ups over brute force, yes. But if, Sorry? True, but you still have to compare the time, right? You, the time that you are spending on this. Uh, because, I, right, I mean, classically I would say that during the optimization process you would, not, you would not try all the possible parameters. You would probably do something smarter, right? To, I don't know, some, some gradient descent or some other optimization methods. I don't know if you see what I mean. But like in here, you're, you're, you're preparing a exponentially large input space. So you're preparing all the possible inputs, and then you're trying to search the best one for the best one. But classically, you usually do something smarter, right? Than then brute forcing over all the possible inputs. So you always get a speed up over the brute forcing technique. It's a bit more tough when it's not brute forcing. But I agree that. Most of the times, you can get a quadratic speedup. Things that are very rare are super quadratic speedups. Polynomial speedups, these are harder to get. Are a bit, there are a bit gems. That, so you, you need to search very well for them. And there are no recipes to find them. And expo exponential speedups are greater. Since you're 
Sure. You mean like how do we implement the function? So the idea is that you are given the function as a black box unitary. So you are, you are given a circuit that implements the function. So just it's like uh, in classical computer computing, you can imagine it as I give you a compiled program and you don't have the source code. So you have a binary, you run the binary, and the binary outputs zero or one, but the binary is very obfuscated and you don't want to reverse engineer the binary. So you, you only have this black box access. Same thing with a quantum computer. So you have, a, you, you have your gate model, so you implement this function with gates. Someone implemented it for you and asked you to find the needle. And so the, the idea is that there is someone that you, you can always turn a, a classical circuit into a quantum circuit. We can always do that. Welcome. Nice. OK, here. So <laughs> I went a bit too far. Uh, so quantum machine learning, that's, the, that's our main topic. Okay. There are two big families of quantum machine learning algorithms, I would say, or two big approaches. Uh, one approach is a heuristic approach, which is a bit more similar to, maybe I would say, deep learning and neural networks, where you might not have guarantees over the running time, but they might work, and you don't have great theoretical guarantees of why they do work. Still, they do. Or you have provable running times where you take all this machine learning problem from an algorithmic point of view, and you, actually, you try to get uh, theoretical asymptotic improvements over these machine learning methods. I'm going to discuss both. I'll start with algorithms with probable running time, which is what I mostly do for, uh, for my research interests. But I'll also tell you a bit more about variational algorithms later. So OK, uh, I think that the field of uh, QML algorithms with probable running time was born around in around 2009 with a paper that is commonly called HHL. This paper called HHL is uh, a paper for solving linear systems. So it tells you that if you have a circuit that you always apply a circuit to the zero state and you get something out of it, so you always start from the zero state. So if you have a circuit that prepares a quantum state B, which is a vector, and you have access to a sparse matrix, we are going to discuss this access later, then what you can do is you can prepare a quantum state that is proportional to the solution of a linear system so that solves the linear system with some epsilon uh, distance in time that does not depend on the system size. So say that you have vectors of dimension n. You're not paying this n. You're, you're only paying it in polylogarithmic terms. Okay? You, what, what you're paying is the condition number, which is basically uh, the ratio between the highest singular value and the smallest singular value. It's a, it's, a, it's a metric that tells you how well behaved your linear system is. So how easy it is, how stable the solutions are. Okay? So you, you, in the original algorithm, you pay a quadratic uh, cost in this term and a linear cost in one over the precision. This algorithm was amazing at the beginning because people didn't expect to have exponential speed ups on solving linear systems and of course led to improvement. So now we have an exponential improvement in the error term. We, are only, we only have a logarithmic scaling of, on the precision and it's linear on, in the condition number, but there are some caveats, okay? So the thing is that this spurred a lot of research in quantum linear algebra techniques and quantum machine learning techniques, but you need to be very careful of how you encode the data because this is assuming access to a quantum vector and you are getting a quantum vector out, right? You're not getting a classical vector. You're getting a quantum system, a quantum state. So you, you don't have access to the full solution. You might observe some properties of the solution or you can use it to run further algorithms. And so, yeah, we will talk about this a bit more in a while. 
But okay, this part, a lot of interest in the subject, nonetheless. So you don't really have exponential speedups now, but still, you might have great polynomial advantages. Okay, and so the idea in the research process of this kind of algorithms is more or less the following. You start by identifying a problem and you find a classical algorithm that is good enough to solve this problem. So a an alg classical algorithm that you like. Learning algorithm, right? And then you select some quantum operations. That, so you want to select an input model, an output model, and some basic operations that you perform during your calculation. You, you, you chain them and you get theorems and you use these theorems with provable guarantees over the running time to compare them to the classical running time. Sometimes the comparisons are clear, sometimes it, it is hard to compare them and you need to run some numerical experiments because quantum algorithms are more similar to randomized algorithms. So they are not directly comparable to deterministic algorithms. So you know, if you're solving an SVD problem, uh, you're, you should compare to something like Lanxos or uh, to the Krylov space methods, power methods, all these randomized algorithms here, not the, like n cube classical algorithms, like the, the standard approaches. Maybe this will be clearer later. Okay. So I'll tell you a bit about the toolbox that people from quantum machine learning community in the far term regime use. And we start by data encoding. Uh, one way of encoding data is you, you need to encode binary data. So you have binary strings and bit strings, right? And you want to encode them in quantum states. If you have a bit string that is long n bits, you just need n qubits. You just put these gates, which are not gates, so they flip zero into ones, and this is a way to encode a bit string. So basically, if you have a, I mean, it takes the same amount of qubits to write a certain number of bits, classical bits. But you can do better for some definition of better. And, it, and what you can do is you encode the information in the amplitudes of your state. So if you have a vector, here, what you can do is you encode it in the linear coefficient of a quantum state, and you get this kind of uh, vector encoded in the amplitudes. What happens here is that if you measure, you don't measure the entries of the vector, but it's somehow like you measure an index of the vector with a probability that is proportional to the magnitude of the vector element. So this is what, what is happening in this slot machine. But what you're doing is you are encoding this information using a logarithmic number of qubits because this, they span this exponentially large space. So you can encode states in this way. A similar thing you can do with matrices, but you will need double the number of registers, okay? An index for the rows and an index for the columns. And whenever you measure, I don't know, a column, then you fix, you, know, you have only the rows that are entangled with those columns, and then, right, and you can sample indices from this matrix, and it also takes only a logarithmic number of qubits, both in the terms of row and columns. And finally, another way of encoding a matrix is to put it in some unitary. So you embed it in a bigger unitary, in a corner of a unitary. Of course, you cannot embed it as it is because maybe your matrix isn't unitary. But what you do is you normalize your matrix, so you squeeze the elements, you make them smaller because you need the unitary matrices have unit norm vectors in columns and rows. So you have to reduce the, the amplitude, I mean the, the size of the elements in, the, in your matrix to embed it in a unitary. And then you pad the unitary with other things and so Q is like the number of extra qubits that you use to embed your matrix in a unitary. And then you have this epsilon because you can tolerate some error while you encode this matrix in your unitary. This is another way of encoding your matrix. This also requires a number of qubits. It, it, this is a matrix that acts on a number of qubits that is logarithmic in the dimension of the matrix. Okay, so I, I told you a bit about 
how I want this data to be encoded, but not about how to do that. What people from quantum machine learning community or quantum optimization community would like to have is a quantum memory. And a quantum memory is a device similar to a classical memory where you have cells that contain values and addresses and you can write classically in these cells and think a bit of, about what is a classical memory. It's basically a function that takes an address and gives you a value. So similarly, what you want in quantum computing is you want a unitary that takes an address and an empty register and entangles the value of the memory cell with the address that you asked for. So this is a, the process that builds a memory, that, that implements a memory. And the quantumness of this memory is that you can query these addresses in a superposition. So if you prepare a state that is in a superposition of addresses, you get a superposition of values, which are entangled to the corresponding, red, to the corresponding index or address. Okay. Um, surprisingly, I mean, you need to take care about initializing this memory. So it is not for free, right? You have to fill classical data in this memory. And uh, the time that you use to build this memory storage is linear in the size of what you're inputting in the memory. That is why solving linear system is not for free because you're putting the data in the memory, right? I mean, if you have them already stored in memory, that's another story some, somehow, but in certain, at a certain point, you will need to input your data if, it, if they are classical data. If they're quantum data, you can have unitaries that produce them and, and the description of unitaries can be compressed, but that's another thing. But so the preparation time is like linear in the matrix size or vector size, in the memory size in general, but the query, so the, the difficulty of implementing this memory is only polylogarithmic in the dimension of the memory. And when I say polylogarithmic, I actually mean in depth. So you can parallelize this memory a lot. And this has been the source of much debate in the quantum community because um, you still require a number of gates that is linear with the size of the memory. It's just that you can compress them in a tree form so that you can parallelize a lot. You can really parallelize a lot. And there are a lot of discussion going on on whether you should count this as a polylog cost or as a linear cost. It really depends on your error correcting methods and a lot of technicalities that are still being discussed, I would say. But this is the, the, the I don't know, the holy grail of, uh, of quantum people that work in quantum computation. Like we, we, we would like to have a quantum memory that is very efficient. And you can quantify the running times in terms of calls to the memory as you would do in classical computing because the memory is like the bottleneck of your computation. Okay, so if you have this memory here, then you can implement all the memory, all the quantum access that I told you before. So you can implement the binary encoding, you can implement the amplitude encoding, there are ways to do that, and you can also implement the block encoding. Uh, this is all in different papers. There are three of them there at the, the bottom, but you can do this, okay, if you had that device. So you imagine you just write them classically, and then you can prepare this quantum access via this routine and some other gates efficiently. Okay, so once you have your data, uh, one other thing is quantum basic linear algebra routines. Uh, moving forward from HHL, there have been algorithms that, again, solve linear systems very efficiently or perform matrix vector multiplication very efficiently. And more recently, there, are, there is also a framework which is very useful, which is singular value transformation. It's basically a, a model of computation, like a way of computing that allow you to manipulate the singular value of the matrix that you're using. So you can perform arbitrary transformation of your matrix. This is, for instance, one way of implementing the inverse. You apply a function to the singular values that is one over x, and you invert the matrix somehow. You transpose the matrix, and then it's inverted. And you do that by polynomial approximation. So you take a function, you do a polynomial approximation, you need to count how many uh, terms of the polynomial you need to approximate the function, and you're gonna build the circuit with rotations. And this is a very powerful technique. And this led to a lot of the quantizations as well. So 
for certain matrices in certain regimes, there are also classical algorithms that can compute uh, basic linear algebra operation with times that do not depend, uh, that depend only logarithmically in the matrix size. But the thing is that they dep depend polynomially on other uh, quantities like the condition number, the precision, and the scaling of the classical algorithm is usually very bad. That is why you don't see them in practice implemented in the wild. Okay. So there is still hope for huge polynomial speedups. That's what we hope for. And lastly, uh, the last routine is are routines to get some outputs. Uh, you can, of course, get, uh, like you can reconstruct a quantum state uh, by sampling and taking statistics. And then you can also estimate amplitudes if they are marked. Like you mark them with a qubit that is set to one, and you are able to estimate this quantity with one over epsilon repetition of this unitary, which is better than what you would do classically. It's, it's basically the Grover speed up, so a quadratic speed up, seen with a, in, a, in a different man manner. Okay? And it's a way to estimate probabilities and expectation values in a faster way, more or less. Okay, so now I'm gonna tell you a bit about an example of a easy quantum machine learning algorithm. Again, I just want to give you an idea of how these algorithms are, are built and what it means to program a quantum computer to, do, to perform machine learning. So that's the, the, the main thing. You will probably not understand in depth what the algorithm is about and I will not even try. Uh, but at least you get an understanding of how it looks like to write this kind of algorithms. So the eigenphases task, uh, it's pretty easy. It's a, it's a classical algorithm for face recognition. The idea is that you have a training set with a bunch of faces. You get a test, a test point or a test sample. And you want, I mean, if it belongs to a subject in your training set, then you answer the, num the ID of the subject in your training set. If it's an unseen phase, you answer that it's an unseen phase. And if it's something completely unrelated, you answer that this is like an outlier, okay? And the original algorithm works like that. It's based on singular value decomposition, PCA, this kind of, uh, of things. And the idea is that uh, phases are not uniformly distributed over the space of the images, right? So what you do is you center your data, extract the top K principal components, and represent your data as, I mean, with, with a weight vector that uh, it's basically a linear combination of these principal components, which are called the eigenphases. Eigenphases because of eigenvectors. That's the idea. So what you do is you... Uh, you take all your training set and either you take centroids or you take the whole, the whole points, the, I mean, all the points that you have and you store these weight vectors and you will use them later to perform comparisons. So this is like the training. You extract the principal components and save the weight vectors. The classification algorithm works like that. Uh, you get a new data point, you center it, right, with a mean that you extracted from the training data set, that data set the training set, and then you compute the weight vector by projecting your data point onto the principal components. So you, you get the weights. You compare your new weight to the centroids or the, the data points, the weight vector of your training set, and you select the closest. Then depending on the distance, if the distance is less than a threshold, you output the index of the closest. If this is somewhere between two thresholds, then it's probably an unseen phase. And if it's really above, the other threshold, it comes from a different distribution. Okay, that's the rough idea. Uh, something else that you could do is you can add this step here, which is an, an additional outlayer detection method, very simple. What you do is you check how much of the norm is preserved after you project your data on the principal components, right? Because uh, if you have a phase, then probably it's well represented in the subspace, but if you don't have a, space, a phase, probably it's not. So you compare it against a threshold and you make an early decision. Cool, so what's the quantum equivalent of this? First of all, we need to encode our data and what we want, uh, we will assume that they are stored in a quantum memory. So we will 
use a quantum memory to store this. Uh, we, have, we already performed the training. We are only interested in performing classification and see if we can speed this up. OK. Uh, maybe let me go back just for one slide. I forgot to tell you about this complexity here. So this is the complexity of the textbook implementation. K is the number of principal components. M is the size of the vector, so of your image, like if you unroll it. And, um, and so this is the complexity that is given by this normal detection method, more or less. And PK is basically the, complex the complexity of searching. P is the number of uh, weight vectors that you have in your training set, so the number of centroids or the number of data points that you use for the comparison. So if you implement it in a deterministic way, an easy way, that's the complexity. OK, and now, um, yeah, OK. So you want your data stored in a quantum memory, and you want, access, you want, you want the uh, weights to be amplitude encoded, and you want the, your um, mean-centered sample to be amplitude encoded as well. And then you want your top K principal components to be in a block encoding. So to be in, in some top left corner of a unitary matrix that you know how to implement with quantum gates. You can, all of, you can do all of that with a memory. So the first thing you want to do is you want to project your quantum state onto the principal components to estimate and even estimate this norm ratio. What you can do is somehow you just prepare this quantum state that you want to project via quantum memory, and you apply the block encoding. So the probability of measuring uh, zero in the first qubits of your block encoding, so the qubits that are not your, the one of your input, is proportional to the threshold that you want to estimate. And this is the cool thing, because you can use amplitude estimation to estimate this amplitude very fast. Okay, that's the first idea. So you create a circuit such that the probability is proportional, the probability of measuring something that you know, so the probability of measuring zeros in this case, is proportional to the quantity that you want to measure. And that's the idea. Similarly, what you want to do next is you want to compute distances in superposition. And you use another circuit like that. So you have another circuit like that where the probability of measuring one qubit is proportional to an inner product. And from the inner product, you can compute all of these quantities. Okay, this is non-trivial because, of course, uh, here, I mean, this UW is the circuit that you used in the previous step. So you, you have to open those boxes and know what gates are in there. And the circuit gets complex and complex, but we represent it with some more abstraction here. So the idea is more or less always preparing things uh, that have some probabilities of happening that are things that you want to measure, things that you like and you want to estimate. And by doing this, you can compute all the distances in superposition with some tricks. And you end up by doing some minimum search with a Grover-like algorithm that gives you a quadratic speed up. So if you chain all of this, what you get is an almost quadratic speed up because it's ju not just like not just Grover, it's a lot of other things. But you see this dependency on MK disappeared. You have a square root dependency on PK, but you have an extra error term. The problem now is that it's not easy to compare these terms, right? Because you don't know what a tolerable epsilon is for your task. This, this epsilon is like an error that you have while estimating your distances. So you want to know what's tolerable and what's not. So what we do usually is we run numerical experiments at this point. And in this case, what you want to do is, again, you want to estimate this error here. And these norms here are just to compensate for errors. Like they, they, they somehow balance these two terms. So you estimate them at once, more or less. So what you do is you implement the classical algorithm. And you just perturb the solution of the classical algorithm by inserting errors where you expect errors to happen. And we uh, did that on some uh, toy data sets, very simple data sets. 
This is like an MNIST data set polluted with some fashion MNIST points that perform as outliers. What we did is we trained this model by maximizing the F1 score, basically. And we studied the performance of this algorithm as you increase the error. So you see how the metrics decrease or get worse as you allow for higher error. But higher error terms mean faster algorithms. So what you want to find is you want to find a trade-off. And in the end, if you plot some, I mean, if you try to work out some results, you see that the running time might improve considerably. You should run accurate resource estimation for that. This is basically just some query complexities, like the number of time you're accessing the memory. So you might lose these speedups if you take into account all the hardware problems. But more or less, this is like you get huge speedups and you don't lose much in accuracy. Right? You, you can tune this. You can decide to lose a lot or you can decide not to lose anything. Okay. That's the idea. So yes, in general, what you want to do is, I mean, what I wanted to say here is that algorithms, quantum algorithms and classical algorithms are not easy to compare, right? Here, this N is disappearing, but it's leaving some space for all these other parameters that you have to estimate. So you have to run a lot of numerical experiments to estimate these parameters, project them, and see more or less where the running time improves, right? Because eventually the quantum running times will be better asymptotically. But you need to make sure that this happens for a reasonable amount of data points and features. Otherwise, if it only happens for irrealistic data sets, it doesn't make sense. Okay, it really depends on whether you're speeding up hours to minutes, uh, days to hours, or a thousand years to a hundred years. You probably won't care in this case, right? Okay, so I have this last part. Uh, which I try to do a bit more quickly. And it's about variational quantum algorithms. Those are some heuristics. I'll go faster. The idea was to develop algorithm for quantum computers that are noisy and that are not really stable. So you have only a handful of qubits and they are noisy. You want circuits to be shallow so that the error doesn't propagate. So the idea was to have circuits that are parameterized. You put parameters in gates and you try to learn a shallow circuit that does the job. It's like, it's like more or less having a neural network where these, these, these things are called ansatz, like the shape of these circuits. And they are really the architecture of the parameterized quantum circuits. Okay? And they control the expressibility of your circuit. You can, uh, they control the inductive bias of your model somehow. The idea is that you have this hybrid quantum uh, and classical optimization process where the classical computer flashes onto the quantum computer a circuit with some parameters, evaluates some expectation values, so it calculates some probabilities by making many measurements, and then optimizes a loss function and puts the parameters back in the circuit. So the circuit always changes, but, the parameter, I mean, but only by the parameters. The, the architecture is almost always the same. It stays the same. Of course, these variational approaches are harder to study, like they have less theoretical guarantees. It's hard to say whether they are fast, faster or slower than classical algorithms, so you don't have all the provable guarantees of the far-term models. But they are great heuristics. I mean, they, they are similar to uh, neural networks in spirit, at least. They suffer from a lot of problems at the moment. One of them is they have local minima, which you could have guessed. And these are always, I mean, uh, due to, uh, I mean, you, you can solve them sometimes with over parameterization. You have this phase shift where if you have enough parameters, you start suppressing local minima. And another technique seems to be to have an adaptive circuit ansatz. So you change the architecture of the circuit during optimization. This will turn some local minima to set dull points. So it will be easier to estimate the gradient and understand that you are in a local minima. So they will change. There are ways of doing that. I suggest you check this paper out. There are barren plateaus. So as the system size increases, the gradient becomes exponentially smaller. 
This is somehow similar to the issue of vanishing gradients when you increase the depth of neural networks. So in here, if you increase the depth of quantum circuits, you have this gradient that vanishes. And it's the same if you increase the amount of entanglement, which is a pity because entanglement is probably the source of quantum speed up. So you don't want to lose too much entanglement. You want to lose a bit of it to avoid barren plateaus. Uh, and finally, you also have problems that are induced by noise. Uh, so it can shift the landscape and move the local minima around. That's a problem. And noise that comes from hardware. So finally, what matters is the architecture that you choose for your variational algorithms. There are architecture that try to mimic feedforward neural networks in the sense that they involve more and more qubits and they discard some of them, passing the information forward. There are architecture that take the number of the, I mean, the, the number of qubits constant throughout the, the circuit. And there are gates like quantum convolutional neural networks that have these pooling layers that halve uh, the number of qubits used throughout the optimization process. Like, so you only have a logarithmic number of layers. And you have these layers that are basically single operation, entanglement, single operation, entanglement. Convolu quantum convolutional neural network, they have a stronger inductive bias because they model um, they model invariance to translation. So they have less expressibility than QNNs, and this allows for um, less barren plateaus. However, these models have recently, like a couple of weeks ago, um, have been shown to be easily uh, simulable. So you can simulate them with classical computers up to a very high number of qubits, like 1,000 qubits, which is insane for simple data sets. It really depends on the data encoding process. So it, it, it also depends on the data sets, if you can simulate the circuit or not. And lastly, I just wanted to tell you that a good research avenue at the moment is geometrical quantum machine learning. So the idea is to restrict the inductive bias of the model. So like you restrict the expressibility of your circuit and you plug like permutation equivariance in the same way we are doing now with graph neural networks. And uh, the idea is that this circuit should reach over parameterization in quicker and should suffer from less barren plateaus. I put here a reference that you should check uh, if you're interested in this topic. And basically, that's it for the talk. I leave you with a bunch of uh, suggested readings that you might like or you might uh, not decide to, uh, to read after this talk. And that's it. Uh, I'm available to <laughs>